In our last video, we mentioned that the formulas to estimate energy requirements should refer to a healthy weight. But how do we determine what a healthy weight is? There are three indicators that can help us evaluate a person's weight, and these are height by weight ratios, body fat composition, and body fat distribution. Height by weight ratios are rather crude but easy and helpful indicators to gauge the health of one's weight, and they simply reflect the notion that the person's weight should be first of all proportional to a person's height. The most important height by weight indicator is the body mass index, or BMI, which is widely used because it is very easy to calculate and predicts fairly well risk of mortality. You can calculate your BMI by taking your weight in kilograms and dividing it by your height in meters squared. For example, a person who weighs 75 kilograms and is 1.65 meters tall has a BMI of 75 divided 1.65 times 1.65 equals 27.5, which is considered overweight. The healthy weight range is a BMI between 18 and 25. Above 25, a person is considered overweight, above 30, obese. Below 18, the person is considered underweight. If we want to use the BMI formula to predict the ideal weight for a given height, we can substitute the ideal BMI of 22 and multiply it for the person's height in meters squared. For example, the ideal weight of our 1.65 meters tall friend would be 22 times 1.65 times 1.65 equals 60 kilograms. The BMI, however, has some important limitations. First, like any other height for weight measure, it does not take into account body composition, meaning it has no way of knowing what percentage of your weight is made of fat and what percentage is lean mass. For example, bodybuilders are often diagnosed obese by the BMI, but actually they are not. They weigh more simply because they have a lot more muscle, which is totally healthy. The problem is having a lot more fat, not a lot more muscle. Conversely, many older people have lost a lot of muscle, but gained a lot of fat. Since these two events compensate each other, their weight ends up being in their normal range. However, this weight is not at all healthy, and these people are actually over fat, if not obese, a condition that we refer to as sarcopenic obesity. Our word overweight is actually misleading and leads many of us to become obsessed with the bathroom scale. The real problem is not being overweight, but being over fat. If I weigh more because I have a lot more muscle, this is not a problem. If I drink a large cup of water, I also weigh more, but it is completely irrelevant to my health status. In most cases, anyway, the BMI does a very good job predicting a healthy weight because for most people, over fat and overweight go hand in hand. The other big limitation of the BMI is that it does not take into account the distribution of body fat how much of it is subcutaneous fat and how much is abdominal. As we will discuss later, this is another very important determinant of, of weight health. My BMI may be in the normality range, but if all my fat is accumulated around my waist, my health is still in danger. Finally, we should also note that the BMI does not do a very good job with very short or very tall persons, as you often mistakenly find the former to be overweight and the latter to be underweight. Adjustments to the BMI formula, however, have been devised to easily fix this last problem. As we already mentioned, body composition, and in particular the percentage of body fat versus lean body mass, is an important determinant of energy expenditure because lean mass consumes more energy. It is mainly for this reason that we use different formulas to estimate energy requirements in men and women. Women require less energy because they have a higher percentage of body fat. However, body fat percentage is highly variable even among individuals of the same gender, and it can range from as little as 2% of total body weight to up until 70%. Determining body composition is also a better way to evaluate healthy weight or diagnose obesity rather than just relying on the BMI. We consider obese a man with over 24% body fat and a woman with more than 35%. But how can we measure body fat? The traditional way to do it is a technique called underwater weighing, although the procedure is quite involved. Luckily, we do have more practical alternative techniques such as air displacement, 
body electrical conductance and near infrared reactance. The most accurate, although expensive, technique is a DEXA scan, which uses a low doses of X rays to identify the percentages of fat tissue, fat free soft tissues, and bones, as well as bone mineral density. A less accurate but constantly improving and way more practical technique is bioelectrical impedance, which can be done today with little and cheap devices, which are also available from home use, sometimes even incorporated in bathroom scales. Another cheap and easy way to estimate total body fat content is the anthropometric measurements of skin fold thickness. All we need is a simple caliper which will measure the thickness of the fat layer under the skin at different specific sites, and then use these numbers to calculate percent body fat using formulas that have been validated against underwater weighing. When we evaluate body weight, body fat composition is one important piece of information, but the distribution of this fat is also extremely important. If body fat is in excess, its location determines the extent of the risk for health. We mainly store excess fat in two different locations. One is the subcutaneous fat, the fat layer under the skin and above our muscles that protects us and insulates us. The other is abdominal fat, which is all around our internal organs in the abdominal cavity to protect them. Both these types of fat also have energy storage function meaning they can be used for energetic purposes if extra energy is needed. Some people deposit more fat in the upper body areas, and in particular in the abdominal region. Abdominal fat is metabolically more active, and it is linked to an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes, for a variety of reasons. First, fat released from abdominal stores does not go into general circulation as fat normally does, for example, when we absorb it from food, and instead goes directly to the liver through the portal vein. <clears throat> the liver is not really prepared to handle this fat, and mostly deposits it, causing hepatic steatosis, or fatty liver, disrupting lipoprotein metabolism and causing insulin resistance. On top of that, Abdominal fat is also a big producer of pro-inflammatory molecules which increase body inflammation, insulin resistance, blood clotting, and blood pressure. The good news is that this type of fat is relatively easy to get rid of, and with proper diet and exercise, it is usually the first to go away. Accumulation of excess fat in the abdominal region is called android obesity, central obesity, visceral fat, abdominal fat, sometimes refers to as apple-shaped obesity, and it is more frequent in men, or women after menopause. The presence of estrogen in women in their reproductive years instead encourages fat deposition in the lower body, mostly the hips and thighs area. Excess fat in these areas is called genoid obesity, or pear-shaped. This fat is much less active and less easily mobilized compared to abdominal fat. The main advantage of this is that it presents much lower risks for our health, and in particular for cardiovascular disease and diabetes, although it can still cause problems of stress on joints leading to osteoarthritis. However, precisely because it does not easily get mobilized, it is also much more difficult to shed, as many young women on weight loss diets have experienced. They lose fat everywhere else, but hips and thighs fat is still there. An easy anthropometric measure to evaluate body fat distribution is measuring the waist circumference, just above the hips. A waist circumference of more than 102 cm in men, or more than 88 cm in women, is indicator of upper body obesity. Ideally, waist circumference should be less than 90 cm in men and less than 84 cm in women. So to recap. There are three main considerations to evaluate the health of a person's weight. First, it has to be appropriate for the person's height. Second, it has to reflect an appropriate body composition, in particular a healthy percentage of fat mass. Third, it has to reflect an appropriate body fat distribution, in particular with regard to abdominal fat. All these parameters reflect a static evaluation of body weight sort of a snapshot of a person's situation at a given time. However, even more important is the dynamic evolution of a person's weight history. Weight variations over the lifetime are useful to help determine a healthy weight. 
What was the weight during adolescence, in the mid-twenties? What was the lowest and the highest? What was it five years ago? A person whose BMI has been 17 whole their life is likely not underweight, just constitutionally thin. A person whose BMI was 24 until five years ago and now dropped to 17 is likely to be malnourished. Recent weight variations are more important to evaluate general health and nutrition status. In particular, an unintentional loss of over 5 kilograms over the last month indicates either severe malnutrition or underlying disease and requires immediate medical attention. For this reason, while being obsessed with our weight is certainly not healthy, completely ignoring it is also not wise. Monitoring our weight from time to time, say not more than once a week, but not less than once a month, is of great importance to keep an eye on unwanted weight variations and take appropriate action if necessary.